News starts right now with the new Johnson and Johnson vaccine. There is renewed questions around the use of fetal tissue and cells making the rounds on social media and questions on whether the Catholic Church is telling people not to get the one dose shot. We decided to put it through our trust index. Although scientists have used fetal cells for years to develop vaccines for diseases like measles and chicken pox, some are now asking were aborted fetuses used to make the new Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Just Degoriato gets answers from a local infectious disease specialist and from the Archbishop himself. At this time, Archbishop Gustavo Sierra made it as clear as he could. Please take the vaccine that is available to you. The Archbishop did in January. He's had both doses of the Moderna vaccine, even though fetal cells were used in the testing for the first two vaccines. Pfizer and Moderna, they do not have the problem. The other one, is questionable. He says Johnson & Johnson used fetal cells not only in its testing and development, but also in producing the vaccine. So it is true. Infectious disease specialist Dr. Ruth Berggren confirms that fetal cells were used in the production. You're getting virus, adenovirus, that contains a piece of DNA that encodes the spike protein. And, and that is what is in the vaccine, not the cells. We don't inject human cells. In fact, our bodies wouldn't even tolerate that. In its statement, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops says, quote, it is morally acceptable to receive COVID-19 vaccines that have used cell lines from aborted fetuses in their research and production process, a message echoed by the Vatican coming at a critical time. The best health care is a priority for us in a pandemic. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Meanwhile, the WellMed vaccine phone line is open once again. The number to make an appointment on your screen, 833-968-1745. That line is open from 8 in the morning till 8 at night daily while slots are available. Those from Phase 1A and 1B are eligible along with teachers and child care workers. WellMed says to keep calling if you can't get through. We'll keep you updated on air and online when the slots fill up. An investigation into the winter crisis plagued by power and water outages in San Antonio last month now in its early stages. A committee on emergency preparedness put together by Mayor Ron Nirenberg met for the first time today. They will meet several times to look into the preparation for the winter storm, the response to it and its impact. CPS Energy, SAWS and the City of San Antonio appear to be the primary focus, but the committee indicated the scope of its inquiries will likely include other entities too. The committee chairman, a former city council member, says they'll identify changes that need to be made. We don't have the authority to change some of these entities, but we have the authority to get the public input, understand what the public is concerned about, what hurt them, and then how we can do better emergency preparedness in the future. William says the committee will post updates on its inquiries as they get them, rather than waiting to compile everything in a final report. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office working to identify a woman killed in a crash this morning. The crash happened just before 2 a.m. on Loop 1604 near Bitters Road on the city's north side. Police say the woman lost control of her vehicle, causing that car to jump a barrier on the access road. Police say the vehicle then spun and hit a pole. The woman pronounced dead at the scene. No other vehicles were involved in the crash. Police are searching for the person responsible for a shooting on the city's south side. Police say the suspect and a woman got into an argument along Ritterman Road. The woman drove away from the scene, but police say the suspect followed. They ended up at the intersection of Connor and West Mitchell Streets. That's where police say the woman's brother then got into an argument with the suspect, who eventually pulled out a gun and shot him. The man was grazed in the shoulder. No one else was hurt. After a year long hiatus due to COVID-19, Morgan's Wonderland finally opened once again. San Antonio's ultra accessible park celebrating its 12th season of fun, but not without ensuring the maximum safety for their staff and guests. Alicia Barrera visited the theme park and has more on the new procedures and policies in place. It's a big day for Richard Flint, one of Morgan Wonderland's biggest fans. My favorite thing about Morgan Wonderland is about being social and meeting everybody and uh, having fun and uh, making friends and 
and having a good time. He was the oh, first hi. in line this morning for Morgan Wonderland's reopening. I showed up in about 9.45. And like many, didn't waste any time jumping straight into the fun. These moments of joy have been a year in the making to help limit exposure to COVID-19 and in turn, allow for more memories to be made. We went to two infectious disease doctors, had them both work with us to come up with a 16 page protocol. That doesn't mean that things are complicated here. It just means that you gotta wear masks, you gotta have separation and things are wiped down and things are just done to keep everything safe. High touch areas like this one will be sanitized periodically by staff. And hand sanitizer has been placed throughout the park to make sure they give joy, not germs. We're extremely excited. Finally, people are able to come in here, have some fun in a safe environment. Be sure to plan your visit online ahead of your arrival to ensure a contactless entry. We ask that you please, please, please purchase your tickets online. We do have capacity um, restrictions that we are putting on the park um, in place. Uh, wear a mask. As for Richard, he says he'll be back very soon. I agree coming back to for us on time in May or June. And although Governor Greg Abbott did announce that Texas will reopen at 100% here at Morgan's Wonderland, capacity will still be limited and all guests ages three and up will be required to wear a mask. Reporting Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. A lump or a bump your child has had for years may, may be the tip of the iceberg that's been growing since he or she last went to the doctor. And in this COVID world, that doctor visit may be long overdue. Ursula Perry explains why childhood cancer rates are expected to rise over the next year and why it will likely be more advanced. Staying home and staying safe may have been the right prescription for keeping COVID away from your child last year, but time marches on when it comes to cancer. The interruption in regular doctor's visits is taking a toll, and new cancers are getting diagnosed at later stages. Ultimately, uh, uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of later presentations, meaning that uh, they're growing to the point where uh, they're fairly obvious. Um, unfortunately, when it's to that degree, uh, uh, it can uh, uh, be more difficult to treat. Because Dr. Asenison says that the concern early on in the pandemic that childhood cancers would be allowed to grow unfettered is being realized. A lump that is now stage two or stage three cancer. A simple blood test or a simple uh, x-ray of sorts to really kind of show the degree uh, uh, that was underneath this lump, kind of like an iceberg. Uh, there's a very, uh, could be a very large issue going on underneath the surface. With most healthcare workers being vaccinated now, as well as the general public, any fear that resuming normal doctor visits and medical screenings might be dangerous should be fading by now. The earlier you find a problem, the faster doctors can find the right therapy to treat it. And that is definitely important when it comes to childhood cancer. A new study is also recommending that kids who do get diagnosed with cancer also get tested to see if they've inherited the cancer gene. Not only will that help families prepare better, it's going to help doctors as well choose the correct therapy to treat the cancer. Apparently, those with that genetic mutation will respond faster and better depending on which therapy is chosen. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Families fighting pediatric cancer don't have to fight it alone. Big Love Cancer Care, an organization dedicated to easing the journey of childhood cancer for patients and families alike. And today, they were at Methodist Children's Hospital giving away food. Methodist, one of the six hospitals around Texas who partner with the organization. And so, so many of our families face food insecurity, um, you know, not knowing uh, when their next warm meal is going to come, um, and we're able to actually give them that meal. Big Love not only offered meals to families, but also a wide variety of snacks. For more information on Big Love's mission and what you can do to help, go to www.biglovecancercare.org. Take a look right now with Time Saver traffic. This is the Trans Guide camera here at I-35 in Evans Road, and you can see traffic is definitely heavy. It looks like the northbound lanes here. Um, things slow going. We don't have any accidents to make you aware of, but hopefully this is just the Friday commute. And what a Friday it has been. Katie Blake in 
for Adam Kasky, Katie. It, it wound up being a beautiful day. If you were out really early this morning, it was humid. We had some low clouds around, but those clouds quickly moved out thanks to a frontal boundary that moved through today. Now, when you think cold front, maybe think a temperature drop, but we made it up to 81 this afternoon and some spots, especially well to the south of Highway 90, have seen temperatures climb into the mid 80s this afternoon, but those temperatures are starting to tumble. We've got a good spread 60s in the whole country, mid 70s here in San Antonio and still some spots in the low 80s well to the south behind that front. It also has gotten windy today. We've got wind gusts up closer to 30 miles per hour at this hour and this evening wind gusts up to 35 miles per hour are not out of the question, so it will be staying gusty this evening as temperatures fall into the 60s of eventually upper 50s as we get a little closer to midnight. Now, while it was warm today, it will be cooler this weekend. We'll talk about your weekend forecast coming up in just a bit. And more and more businesses have announced that they still plan to require masks even after the statewide mask mandate ends next Wednesday. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf said yesterday Someone refusing to wear a mask inside a business that requires them could be charged with trespassing if the business calls in law enforcement to remove that person. You can find that story right now on our website, along with a list of businesses who are still requiring masks from their customers. And we have heard all week in the daily briefings from the mayor and the county judge about them urging people to continue to mask up. Let's go live now to City Hall. President and CEO of University Health System here in San Antonio. And this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting 287 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total since the pandemic began to 197,784. Our new seven-day rolling average now has dipped below 300 and sits at 298. Sadly, we are reporting three new deaths this evening. We've lost in total 2,681 of our neighbors and friends and family members to COVID-19. Please remember them over the weekend and keep their families in your prayers. Each one of these numbers that we report is a loved one that we've lost and we continue to mourn for. Over in our hospitals, we're seeing more improvements. Uh, there are 335 COVID-19 patients in our hospitals tonight. That's the lowest number of patients we've seen in our hospitals since early November. Over the last 24 hours, there are 34 new admissions to the hospital for COVID, 190, excuse me, 126 patients in the ICU, and 65 are on ventilators. With numbers moving in the right direction, again, as we continue to remind folks, uh, please do your part. Do not let your guard down. Let's get to the end of this pandemic together. As of yesterday in Bear County, we have now vaccinated two thousand, excuse me, two hundred and seventy two thousand two hundred and eighty nine people with their first dose uh, and one hundred and fifty seven thousand two hundred and ninety, excuse me, one hundred and fifty seven thousand nine hundred and twenty one people uh, with uh, the full vaccination. That's both doses of the of the uh, brands that are available to us right now. Let's continue to wear our masks and social distance as we work to get more people vaccinated. And we will continue to do our part together as a community to save lives and keep each other healthy. Let me turn it now to Judge Wolf. Well, as the mayor said, we're on a downslide in terms of cases and uh, Everybody's been really doing a good job. I was out there today quite a bit around, and most people, well, almost everybody I saw was still wearing a face mask, and we want to thank you very, very much for that. But we do need to remember we still are getting cases. I think it was 287 yesterday that were infected. Uh, we're still getting new people in the hospital. We're still having deaths. So so it's not over yet, and, and uh, we still have a ways to go to uh, bring this down to where we've defeated this uh, this terrible uh, pathogen that we've had, COVID-19. Uh, I want to really reach out tonight and thank several businesses that have stated that they will still continue to require a face mask if you're going to come in their business. You know, the business community might save us by, uh, by taking that kind of a stand. I had a conversation with Jimmy Haslocker today. In fact, I was over at his restaurant today on, on Blanco and 410. They're going to continue to require a face mask. Had a conversation with Bobby Pettis, and they were having their first uh, game, I think, on March the 14th, I think it is, uh, where they will have fans, but they're going to uh, stay up to about 17% now, and they will require face masks. So I want to thank uh, the Spurs for doing that. Alamo Draft House has announced they would. Macy's has announced. SeaWorld and Fiesta Texas have both said people have got to wear 
face masks. Starbucks is continuing to do it. Target is doing it. Break, break, read a little rain in the Pearl. Carmelita's a Mexican restaurant. And as more uh, uh, businesses uh, decide to continue to do what we've been doing, a uh, re- requirement of face masks, we do have the sheriff's office that will be there to respond if they need any help with a customer that kind of gets out of line, and we will help remove them if that, if that happens. Uh, George Hernandez is with us tonight. He's the uh, president of the Bear County Hospital District University Hospital and doing an absolutely amazing job, um, not only with what's happening with vaccines, but also with running a first-class hospital system. Uh, uh, we've done a total of 167,000 now vaccines, and that's about 60% of all the vaccines that have been given in the city. Uh, and, and, we're, and this past week, uh, they did 28,500, almost all of them at the, uh, at the uh, Wonderland Mall, but also quite a few, four or 500 a day down at the Robert B. Green. So they're uh, really moving along on March 13th. They're going to uh, really sock in there and make sure we haven't uh, missed any health care professionals. And as I mentioned, I think the day before yesterday, they've done 14,000 already teachers and administrators, and, and, and they will be doing uh, more starting on March the 22nd. So I uh, want to compliment them and all the people that are working so hard out there and doing the best they can with all the vaccines that we have. More vaccines, we'll get more, um, more people uh, shots, but uh, we've got to get more vaccines first. Great. Thank you, Judge. And also some people that have been working very hard throughout this pandemic. I want to thank Dr. Jack Sai and his team at UT Health School of Public Health here in San Antonio have been incredible partners in our fight against COVID-19. I especially want to take a moment to acknowledge some contact tracers of the week under Jack Sai. Thank you to Aishwara Sharma and Nicole Beenan for your dedication to our community efforts and keeping us all safe and healthy. Our contact tracers have been out there working incredible hours uh, to make sure that we can I- identify and investigate each one of these cases. Remember that you can subscribe to COVID-19 alerts by texting COSAGOV to 55000. You can also get the latest on our uh, fight against this pandemic by going to COVID-19 sanantonio.gov please all right more encouraging numbers coming from city hall with the mayor and the county judge though the judge saying it is not over yet and he actually went out of his way to thank specific businesses that are still requiring people wear masks to uh, be served or to get services in their businesses he actually says the businesses may save us in this whole thing but the number of people that are getting vaccines so far Impressive. 272,289 people got their first dose. 157,921 got their full dose. Now that's the city and the county. It doesn't mean that those are necessarily city and county residents, but that's the number of vaccinations that they've done uh, throughout the city and the county so far. And that's the number we want to see on the high end as far as the COVID cases. That's the number we're happy to see is low. New cases, 287 reported today, 335 people in the hospital. There were three new deaths reported uh, there this evening, and that seven-day rolling average that we always take a look at, 298 cases on average reported every 24 hours. And we did hear the county judge talk about which businesses are going to continue to wear, uh, require customers to wear masks. We actually have a list of many of the ones he mentioned and more on our website right now. You can check that out at ksat.com. All right, a lot of kids out there are very happy that their (laughs) school day is over because it means they're on spring break and they're going to be looking towards next week. Yep. You know, Katie, we may want rain. They probably don't, yeah. but we could still use rain. Yeah, kind of hard to reason that in the drought with kiddos, right? Yes. Um, it looks like next week is going to be fairly cloudy and we'll turn muggy again by next week, but I don't see a whole lot of measurable rain in the forecast next week. So if, if that's your spring break, you will have to contend with some cloud cover and higher humidity but no good chances of rain in the next seven days. I'm going to start off with visibility, and you may think this is odd because it's so sunny outside. We can't possibly be talking about fog. No, we're not talking about fog, but you'll notice out in Del Rio, visibility is down to five miles. That's because there's an area of blowing dust that has moved into places like Valverde County, Del Rio, and some of our westernmost communities. So here's San Antonio. There's I-35. There's the Edwards Plateau. So this is well west of San Antonio, but a big plume of dust here has gotten picked up because of the windy conditions 
conditions across the state and that dust is moving down to the south. So if you're in Val Verde County, Del Rio, even down the border into Maverick County and Eagle Pass, you could see some of this dust this evening and it'll just make things look a bit hazy, could be a bit irritating as well if you have to be outdoors. So do keep that in mind again. That's well west of San Antonio. Uh, that dust has been picked up in West Texas because it is windy all across the state behind a front that came through early in the day today. That front now in the Gulf of Mexico and in the wake of this cold front, we're going to see pretty quiet weather this weekend, but it will be cooler. So I know it's been quite warm the past couple of days. We got up to 81 this afternoon, but it will be cooler this weekend behind that frontal boundary. Still staying a touch breezy tomorrow. Highs in the mid to upper 60s. On Sunday, winds will finally relax and oh, we'll get temperatures closer to 70 degrees. But again, again compared to how warm uh, it was out there today, it is going to be significantly cooler over the next couple of days. Gusty tonight through the first part of the day on Saturday and then breezy by Saturday afternoon. Again, lighter winds on Sunday. Now next week, again, pretty quiet. No good chances of rain here, uh, but each day is going to start to feel a bit more humid. It'll be downright muggy by the middle of next week and it'll get warmer next week as well with high temperatures climbing back into the upper 70s and low 80s. So nice out there this weekend, but certainly a little bit cooler. But those temperatures are a lot more seasonable uh, than the 80s that we had out there today, guys. No real rain on the spring break parade, though. Looking Perfect. good, kids. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. The shorthanded Spurs about to go on a little all-star break as well. And they're going to need that five days off in between games because when they start the second half of the season, they're going to play 40 games in 68 days, so they need to rest up and get healthy. And the TMI boys soccer team going for a three-peat, and they did it. We got the highlights coming up. at the All-Star break by falling to the OKC Thunder 107-102 last night. It was their third game in four nights, and they played without L.A., Rudy Gay, Derek White, and Devin Vassell. The Spurs led OKC by 14 points in the third, the 13 second-half turnovers, and 19 total of the 26 points for the Thunder. The Spurs will now enjoy a nice break before resuming the second half of the season March 10th at Dallas, kicking off a stretch of 40 games in 68 days. Yeah, I think just the rest of uh, staying, staying in shape, you know, so you can get in your gyms or whatever, uh, condition everything, just keep your body right because when we come back, uh, it's going to be go time and it's going to be really, really important. Uh, you know, obviously it feels good to be on the winning side, you know, as far as the first half of the season, but, you know, the second half of the season is going to be really important. In high school soccer, Shirts John Paul II take the field at Round Rock to face Dallas Covenant in Taps Girls Soccer Division III Championship. And the Knights are pulling away in the second half. Caitlin Swan moves right and shoots left to make it 2-0 Dallas. JP2 answers back. Emily Rompel gets free on a breakaway and puts it past the keeper, and that cuts the lead in half. But Dallas Covenant was just too much. Mary Golick scored with some four minutes to go to clinch the win. The Guardians fall short of a second straight title. 3-1 is the final. Very, very proud of the girls. They fought hard. They came back. They got in the game at 2-1. And then, you know, the state final, you're just pushing. You have everybody forward, and they just caught us 3-1. So they're a very, very good side. You know, we played them last year in the state championship, and I'm sure they'll be back, and I'm sure that we'll be back. This morning at 9, the John Paul II Catholic High School boys faced off with Dallas Covenant for the TAP Soccer Division Three state title. And the Knights strike first in the 10th minute. Elliot Curlin just sneaks a shot past the keeper, and it's 1-0. Dallas Covenant, your halftime score. Second half, Guardians put the pressure on Oscar Bernal Jr. with the shot, and there's a juicy rebound out front, but goalkeeper Kyler Zachary covers to make a great stop. Then midway through the second half, JP2 with another great chance. Bernal's shot trickles on goal, but Jonathan Kern slides his leg out for the goal line save. The Guardians come up short in the title game, 1-0. They were all very responsive. They all played their hearts out. You know, soccer is a funny game. I mean, credit to, to Dallas. They played well. They did their game plan well, um, you know, and uh, <laughs> soccer's funny. And we end with Division II action. TMI boys going for their third straight championship against Frisco Liberty Christian. Panthers up 1-0 in the second half and rolling. Senior Tristan Smith bends this free kick past the keeper, and it's 2-0. And that ignites the Panthers' offense. A few minutes later, long ball ahead for Patricio Pata, and the Cornell commit chips it over the keeper for her second goal of the game. Man, that was beautiful. That makes it 3-0. Then later in the half, Pata sends a corner on goal, and Simon Roop heads it in to make it three in a row. Roop, there it is. The Panthers win it. 
just crazy. Winning three years in a row um, since my sophomore year, winning sophomore year, winning junior year, then senior year, it's it's definitely surreal. It's, it's immaculate. It's a, it's a great feeling, one that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. First first year I was here, we had a tough loss, semifinals, um, and you know we vowed to never feel that way again, and here we are. I love that excitement. Congratulations. Yeah, that's awesome. Congratulations indeed. Thank you, Larry. Yep. We'll be right back. In October, a president was elected from the city of San Antonio. We are talking about the new president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. She is Nora Lopez. She's the Metro editor with the San Antonio Express News as well. She joins us for this case head Q&A. Nora, it's great to see you. Talk about NAHJ and then the San Antonio Association of Hispanic Journalists and what the main mission is, what the main goals of those organizations are. Sure. Thank you, Steve. Um, and thank you for inviting me uh, to be on your show uh, to talk about two groups who are, whose work is uh, something I'm really passionate about. Um, and that's the San Antonio Association of Hispanic Journalists and the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. And, and really the two groups, um, our primary focus is trying to make sure that we get uh, minority students uh, interested in journalism and helping them to get to school and then helping to get them into that pipeline so that eventually they are on camera like you, Steve, um, talking about the news or maybe uh, they're in a, a newspaper newsroom like me uh, helping to direct coverage. Um, both our groups believe that if you want a successful newsroom, it has to be representative of the diversity of the population in terms of gender, sexuality, disability, and of course, uh, ethnicity. Um, we think that newsrooms uh, that reflect the community that they cover gets better stories. Um, so um, that's sort of the focus. Uh, we raise money for scholarships, and then we try to advocate for uh, more uh, minorities in our newsrooms. We have similar conversations in our newsroom here as well. And I've, I've been wanting to ask you this all day about why is that so important that not only diverse voices are included in a story and a coverage of an event, but also there's diversity in the voices that are telling that story. Where's what's the benefit there? The benefit is that, you know, we all bring our perspective and um, our, you know, our where we grew up, what part, even what part of what part of the country you go, grew up, your particular state, um, your your educational background. All of these things go into, you know, making you a more informed, uh, a better informed reader, maybe on certain uh, stories. And so you're able to bring a different perspective. And um, and especially if you live in a city like we do, that's majority Latino, um, it's important, I think, for our students to our young kids to see people like them on TV uh, or in our news pages uh, as columnists and to see that, you know, the, that they can have a voice in their community, that they can uh, shed a spotlight on stories uh, in their communities. Um, I think. All of that is very important. That's why we think it's really uh, urgent that our newsrooms reflect uh, the community they cover. You know, um, it seems like every four years, um, the Latinos in particular uh, become the, the the fodder for you know political pundits. You know, every year Latinos are expected to somehow you know impact uh, the presidential elections. And then every year there there's like express shock that, oh, the Latinos didn't all coalesce under one umbrella or so forth. And so it's like every four years they discovered that the Latino community is actually, um, you know, consists of a lot of complex nuances. We come from different nationalities, religions, we're separated by things like class and citizenship, uh, generational differences, geographic concentration, as I mentioned. Um, and yeah, not all Latinos speak Spanish. Um, so there's there's so many nuances to our community, and very often we Latinos are not included in that conversation. You have these talking heads who are just talking at us about us, and we think it's important that we be there at the table. Absolutely. I, one of the great things that both NAHJ and SAHJ do is they 
help kids get into college and help them get into the business that both that we're all in that are talking here, Nora. What does that look like? If there's somebody at home right now that's watching this going, hey, I want to do what Nora does. I want to be a writer. I want to do what Steve and Myra do. I want to be on camera. What is out there to help them achieve that? There's so many programs um, for uh, so many scholarship programs. We've got the SHJ, which is hyper-local. These are scholarships that go specifically to students who are either uh, from here, but you might be attending college uh, or university outside of state. But if your home address is here, you qualify. Or we also offer it to students who uh, may be from New York, but they're attending, uh, you know, uh, a school here, St. Mary's University, um, whatever local university, you qualify as well. Um, and so SHJ gives out, you know, I, last year I believe we gave out just about $50,000. Um, so we've got a lot of money to give out. Um, National has given out over $100,000 in scholarships. And so this is a way to make it easier for minority students um, to, you know, get that money to get to school and to stay in school and hopefully, you know, to be able to go to school full time and not have to work, um, because that's something that's very, very common in the Latino community. Um, kids feel like, you know, they can't take the time to just concentrate on school because they have to have that part time job to help um, to help not not only to help them in their day to day living, but maybe even contribute to the family. Um, so that's why these scholarships are so important. And so, Nora, um, if, if we're wrapping up here, just a few more seconds left, but I want to make sure people know how they can take part in that. So if someone is watching this at home, they're interested in finding out more about these scholarships, ways they can get involved with your organization, what should they do? They can look us up online at saahj.org and naahj.org. Madam President. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. And it just flew by. I mean, I had so many things I wanted to ask you, so I'm just going to have to text you the rest of the questions I have, Nora. Thank you, Steve. Take care. Nice to see you. We'll be right back. KSAT explains a wonderful opportunity to dive deeper into different subjects, and it's the cradle of Texas Liberty, the shrine of Texas Liberty. I mean, it's been called many things and it's basically the heart of San Antonio. It absolutely is. That's the focus of this week's newest episode, the Alamo. KSAT explains what is happening at the Alamo. If you've been following along at all over the last couple of years, you know there's a plan to redesign Alamo Plaza and to revamp the way that countless visitors learn about and experience Texas history on those grounds, but it's not been an easy fight and it certainly has been one over this very old battleground over whose stories should be told, how they should be told and the look to the actual physical presentation of what is there at Alamo Plaza. So we're talking about where that plan stands now and all the different voices, some of which you may not have heard before that really want to see to the table here. And there's been so many ideas on how to improve the Alamo grounds, how the Alamo should look, who should be heard from, that it's hard to keep track of what the latest plans are. And some of that is also detailed in case that explains. Absolutely. And I'm going to throw a word out there that some people may have a question about Cenotaph. If you've ever wondered what's the deal with the Cenotaph, what is the Cenotaph? We explain that because it has been such a focal point of everything that's been real contentious uh, about these plans. So check out this latest episode of case that explains. You'll understand where the Alamo plans stand at this point and how we got to where we are today and some of the myths as well that have been told over the years when it comes to the Alamo and the effort to try to make it more of an inclusive story going forward. KSAT explains the latest episode out now. It's on right now. On right now, KSAT.com slash explains as well as the KSAT TV app. Great. Katie will have weather after the break. You know, today I um, put my convertible top down. Ooh, yeah. I was going to say I took my top off, but I met my car and I thought that would come out wrong. So that's why I, would, really I hesitated I a little bit. I appreciate the clarification. Because I wanted to clarify. So does everyone at exactly home. Exactly what happened <laughs> We today. now know what top 
Steve took off. It was nice there. weather. Yeah. That's what I was, was basically that was trying <laughs> to get to. Yeah. It was really nice. I, <laughs> again, thank you for clarifying. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Can't thank you enough. Um, it was unseasonably warm today for a lot of us climbing into the 80s. It will be cooler this weekend because we had a front move through today. That cooler air lagging behind just a bit, so it didn't get too chilly today. But uh, you'll notice a cool down this weekend. It also got fairly gusty this afternoon behind that frontal boundary. Winds are still gusting up closer to 25, 30 miles per hour. And essentially tonight through early tomorrow morning, I can't rule out these wind gusts staying up closer to uh, the 25 to 30 mile per hour range. So you may hear the wind howling at times tonight. Could have some tree branches, um, you know, brushing up on the side of your house or your window. Uh, that may make a little bit noise, a uh, little bit of noise, but staying a bit gusty tonight. As we get into midday Saturday, winds will really start to relax. Still a touch breezy tomorrow, but not as gusty as what we're dealing with right now. Uh, we do need rain. Latest drought monitor updated each Thursday. Um, so this is the change over the past week. This was updated yesterday. Not a whole lot of change here. We've still got a big portion of the area that is at least in a moderate drought. That's that tan color, and that does cover a good portion of the KSAT viewing area. Uh, we've also gotten some of our southernmost counties extreme drought, and uh, the drought conditions are pretty bad elsewhere across the state, especially out near the Big Bend region. Uh, between uh, El Paso and San Angelo and then up in the western panhandle. So we've got some very dry earth in West Texas. Uh, windy conditions across Texas as well because of that front that moved through today. Everyone dealing with windy breezy conditions across the Lone Star State. So when you pair very dry soil with windy conditions, you have periods of blowing dust, and that is what has happened out in the western portion of the state today. So here's San Antonio and I-35 well off to the west. Places like Eagle Pass, Maverick County, up to Del Rio and Valverde County. You guys are dealing with some lower visibilities right now because of this plume of dust that has moved in from the northern and western portion of Texas, and that has dropped the visibility in Del Rio to five miles, so certainly could make things look hazy. It can be irritating uh, when that dust moves through again. I expect that to stay well west of San Antonio this evening for, for any of our communities. Uh, Del Rio over to Kinney County, uh, Brackettville there down to Eagle Pass, even Carrizo Springs and Uvalde. You guys could see some of this dust uh, this evening. It should clear out late tonight and won't be an issue tomorrow. Meanwhile, here in San Antonio, really nice picture here on our live cam shot. We're in the mid 70s. Dew points are low. Still, of course, a touch breezy out there, and again, it'll stay gusty tonight. Temperature wise, 60s in the hill country, 76 in Pleasanton, still a few spots in the low 80s, uh, but with some dry air in place this evening. Our temperatures will fall off at a pretty good pace over the next few hours. So future cast shows a little batch of clouds moving in tonight through early Saturday. So we'll call it partly cloudy tonight through early tomorrow morning. Overnight lows falling into the mid 40s up in the hill country, a low around 50 in Del Rio, also right around 50 here in San Antonio. I can't rule out some periods of cloudiness, not only tomorrow, but also as we get into Sunday. Uh, but we should still have a decent amount of sunshine this weekend, but it will be cooler. Keep that in mind tomorrow, not jumping into the 80s tomorrow like we did today. A lot of us will be stuck with high temperatures tomorrow mid to upper 60s, so much cooler as compared to today. Humidity is also low behind today's front. Our dew point numbers right now are some 10 to 20 degrees lower than they were this time yesterday, and that dry air will hang around through the weekend. It's not until middle of next week that dew points really start to climb once again, and I would say by about Wednesday it'll feel downright muggy. It will also be warmer by early next week as well. So That's we'll be complaining about the mugginess just three <laughs> weeks after we were complaining about right. the ice and the right. snow no. and the freezing drizzle. Yeah. yeah, that sounds about right. Of course. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. In case you missed it, coming up next. Good morning, everybody. We made it to Friday. It's March 5th. Happy Friday. Thank you so much for joining us. And some Bear County residents are still without running water in their homes two weeks after that storm. Today, Bear County launched its I Need a Plumber and Reimbursement programs. If you live in the county, you're still without running water because of the winter freeze. The county offering to pay up to $1,500 for parts and repairs if you cannot find a plumber or cannot afford to pay for one. Meantime, two fatal shootings under investigation tonight. The Bear County Sheriff's Office trying to figure out why a man was shot and killed at a Northwest Side apartment. Sheriff's deputies found the man dead in the living room. He'd been shot in the face. 
Several people taken in for questioning, but no arrests have been made. 18 year old is facing a murder charge in the death of his stepfather, Jaron Diego Garcia, accused of fatally shooting 49 year old Mark Ramos last night. San Antonio police say Garcia intervened in an argument between Ramos and Garcia's mother. Garcia ended up shooting Ramos several times in the chest. He died at the University Hospital. Johnson & Johnson announced its plans to study the vaccine in adolescents. Children who have a very low chance of becoming severely ill from COVID-19 were not part of the initial tests in the rapid approval process of the vaccines. The Johnson & Johnson CEO says it will begin testing in people ages 12 to 18 and go down from there. He also says Johnson & Johnson is likely to have a COVID-19 vaccine available for those under 18 by September. <laughs> All right, cooler this weekend, but by the middle of next week, we'll be back to upper 70s, low 80s. Also getting very muggy again by the middle of next week. So if spring break is next week for you, a lot of clouds, but no rain. All right, thanks, Katie. Mm -hmm. and thanks for watching the news at 6. See you back here on the Night Beat at